Every square inch of this earth is God's. Every moment of your day is God's moment, and every breath you take is borrowed on time from His breath. You are God's. He is far more secular than we often think. Why does God delight in our everyday lives? That's the question John Piper answers from Proverbs 11.1 1 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on April 5th, 1987. Today we move out one last step to that part of life which is not ordinarily considered religious. You might call it the secular part of your life, meaning the part in which you have ordinary dealings with the world. You might call it the business dimension of your life or the professional or vocational dimension of your life. I mean, things like filling your gas tank, buying antiques, punching a time card, paying your taxes. Does God have an interest in this non-religious dimension of, of your life? The store, the office, the shop, the kitchen... Are there any wrong behaviors in these areas which are so significant they could be called in God's eyes an abomination? Now, with this concern, we've moved out from the center of heart, hope, almost as far as you can go. Hope, prayer, general obedience, and now public justice. But there is one more step that we could take, and I want to take them both this morning. We could ask, does God have any delight in the behavior of non-Christian integrity? Non-Christian or unbelieving honesty and justice. So really, there are two areas that I want to examine with you this morning. The non-religious area of the life of a believer. And then secondly, the non-religious area of the life of an unbeliever. I want to ask, what are God's delights in these two areas and why are they? So first of all, let's just take them both together. And ask this question from our text, verse one of chapter 11 in the book of Proverbs. What's included? What are we going to talk about this morning? What's implied in in all these spheres in verse one? A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Well, now the implications here are tremendously far reaching. But let me go back with you way back before Christ and put ourselves into the situation of this verse. Suppose that you are a merchant in the Old Testament days and your job is to sell cornmeal. That's the way you make your livelihood. A good price for cornmeal, a fair price for cornmeal would say be 10 cents a pound. And people come to you and they say, I would like five pounds of cornmeal. And you take your five pound stone and in your balances you set the the stone in one side of your dish. And then you begin to pour your meal from your bag into it until the scales balance out. And then you lift the dish off and pour it into their bag that they have brought. And then suppose that night... You decide to take a sharp blade and begin to, with a very small opening, dig into this stone. Once you're in, you begin to hollow it out. 
and scrape out the, the dust until it weighs four pounds. And then you cover over that little hole with some clay, the same color as the stone, and smooth it off. And then the next day, you're very careful. You watch who comes for their cornmeal. You don't try it on the educated or the strong. They might question the size of the cornmeal pile. They might even look carefully at your stone. You wait until a little child comes who has the 50 cents from his mother. And uh, then you put the four-pound weight on, pour out the meal, and give him his four pounds and take his 50 cents. And then when the widow comes who is not able to see so well, you put the stone on and you weigh out her four pounds and take her 50 cents. And the Bible calls this an abomination in the eyes of God. The same word he uses for incest and homosexuality. What does this verse refer to today? In the next 10 days, many of you will be filling out your tax returns. And this verse says, there is a way to do that which will be an abomination to God. And there is a way to do that which will be a delight to God. Deceit about earnings. Another one would be an insurance claim, saying that more of your fence was torn down than really was. It cost more to replace than it really did because you've learned how much you can push. The other side is injustice, not just deceit from within, but injustice is always done towards others from without in transaction like this. You might stick a person with a lemon of a car because you didn't tell them what was wrong with it when you sold it. You might rush a refugee into the signing of a lease for an apartment that is way too small and then charge far too much and never make any improvements. So I hope from these few illustrations that you can see that this verse 1 of Proverbs 11 is relevant. It is full of implications. There can be deceitful sellers and deceitful buyers. There can be the injustice in buying and there can be injustice in selling. And the first lesson then that we should learn from this verse is that God does have an interest in your non-religious life. All our business transactions are His concern. Every square inch of this earth is God's. Every moment of your day is God's moment, and every breath you take is borrowed on time from His breath. You are God's. He is far more secular than we often think. Charles Bridges poses a provocative question for us. Is it not a solemn thought that the eye of God marks all our common dealings of life either as an abomination or a delight? Now, I want to ask the question, why is a just weight a delight to God in the hand of believers? And then at the end, I'll ask, is a just weight a delight to God in the hand of unbelievers? First, let's talk about believers. Why is a just weight a delight to God in the hand of believers? The answer given in Scripture is that fair prices, honest dealings, and just weights are a delight to God in the life of a believer 
because they express God-honoring faith. Or another way to put it would be, they give expression to or make visible the saving lordship of God in their lives. Now turn with me, if you'd like to follow, to Leviticus chapter 19, if you want to see where I'm getting this. Leviticus 19, verses 35 to 37. What we have in these verses is God dealing again with just weights and measures. But now he's giving a motive, and it is an amazingly solemn and great motive. It is a God-centered motive. And I want to commend it to you. I'll begin reading at verse 35 and read through verse 37 of Leviticus 19. You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measures of length, or weight, or quantity. You shall have just balances and just weights and a just ephah and a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am Yahweh. That's the personal name behind that big caps, Lord, in your English Bible. Now, how is God motivating honest dealings in daily life? In verse 36, he says three things. First, I am Yahweh. Now, that name, you remember, was revealed to the people of Israel just before the Exodus. And when God revealed it to them, how did he define it? I am who I am. This name Yahweh, built on the verb I am, is meant to signify absoluteness, freedom, independence, sovereignty. And so he's saying, do you know me by name? That I am God. Second thing he says. I am your God. Your God. In other words, I'm for you. I'm on your side. All my independence and sovereignty and freedom and absoluteness are yours. That's what it means to have God as your God. And third in this verse, he says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. That means I have borne witness. I have given demonstration of these things that my power, my sovereignty, my absoluteness, my independence, my freedom is not used to kill. It's used to save my people I do mighty things on behalf of those who name me as their God. Now, what's that got to do with your taxes? Heaps. Heaps. Verse 36 says, you shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hen. I'm the Lord. I'm Yahweh. Your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? What's the reasoning here? Isn't the reasoning this? If you really know me as Yahweh, the absolute, the sovereign, the free, the powerful. If you really trust me as your God on your side for you with all my omnipotence. If your faith is really encouraged and strengthened by my demonstration of love and power in the exodus, in the death and resurrection, in the second exodus, can you really be like other people and cheat your way to happiness? No way. No way. It is a psychological impossibility that someone would know God. To be his God, 
Trust the omnipotence of God to be on his side. Look at the exodus, the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the testimony of God's love and say, I must lie to make a life for myself. Impossible. Impossible. It is unbelief. It is unbelief that digs the center out of a five-pound weight and that does not report honorariums. Proverbs 20, verse 17 says, Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward... His mouth is full of gravel. What does that mean? That means that every time we think that we can enhance our lives through deceit in our business dealings, we bear witness that we are judging the fleeting pleasures of sin to be preferred above the everlasting peace of God. The sweetness of the bread of deceit. Yes, 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 give it to me. Who needs the smile and fellowship and peace of the Almighty? What a folly. How blind we are. What about unbelievers? What about unbelievers? There are honest unbelievers. And there are unbelievers with remarkable business integrity. And just dealings. Is it a delight to God? No. And yes. No and yes, because God can look at this integrity in two different ways. When God looks at an unbeliever's honesty and justice as the outworking and expression of a heart of unbelief and rebellion, it is sin and he does not delight in it. Romans 14.23, whatever is not from faith is sin. And God does not delight in sin, no matter how moral it is. Let me use an illustration here. This is a new insight for me. I hope it helps you as much as it has helped me. Honest unbelievers are like rebellious teenage sons. They leave home angry at their parents, or indifferent. They've rejected their parents and their parents' ways, and they go to a strange city. And yet to make it in the world, they realize they've got to play by some of the parents' rules, and so they get a job as a cook in a restaurant. Without knowing it, a few months later, the parents visit this city. And they go to this restaurant and order one of their favorite Meals, one of their delights. Call it just scales, fair weights, dinner. And without knowing it, their son in the kitchen prepares their favorite meal for his parents. And they eat it and they enjoy it. And all the while in the kitchen, he is rebelling against them. If his parents were granted to know the truth of what's going on in the kitchen of that restaurant, they would not say, they would not say, oh, good, our son has begun to do what delights us. They wouldn't. And 
so God does not delight in the honesty and the justice of unbelievers when he looks at it as an expression of and an outgrowth of a rebellious and unbelieving heart. Acts done without any trust in God's grace and without any love for his glory are not a delight to God. But yes, they are. Yes, they are. Because God can look at them another way. He can look at them as a fragment of his own divine work. I get this from Proverbs 16.11. In Proverbs 16.11, it says, A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. All the weights in the bag are his work. I take this to mean that wherever you find just scales and fair weights, you find the work of God. Honesty was his idea. Integrity is his creation. Even in unbelievers, just like their hands are his creation. And their brain is his creation. And their ability to think is his creation. So every act of honesty and justice is the work of God. Theologians call this common grace. Common grace. The justice that prevails in an unbelieving society and the integrity that is manifested in the business dealings of unbelievers is a work of God's common grace. It is not saving grace. It does not get anyone to heaven. But it is grace. It is the preservation of the fragment of the image of God. It is an echo of a law written on their hearts. And God, in mercy toward this fallen world, uses the common grace of the integrity of unbelievers to keep our fallen and wicked society from plummeting headlong into anarchy and chaos. It is all owing to God that unbelievers will keep the speed limit, just like it is owing to God that we will. Every act of integrity and honesty and justice is a work of God and His common Grace. The honesty of an unbeliever is like this seashell. There's no life in it. No life at all. It used to be. But it does have some beauty. Has some shape and form and symmetry. And therefore, it has some uses in life. Life is better because it exists. I'm glad it exists. You could plant a flower in it. I've seen them used to stud rock walls. There's some use for this thing without any life in it. And there is use for the integrity of unbelievers. It's a shell of holiness. It's a vestige of the image of God. It's a residue of something glorious and beautiful in the heart of God. It's a work of His preserving grace, keeping humanity back from the precipice of anarchy 
and chaos. And when God looks on honesty and integrity and justice and fairness in this way, he delights in it. Even in the lives of unbelievers. Because it is his work. And we ought to give him thanks for every honest unbeliever. Him thanks for every politician who has integrity. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series, What Makes God Happy?, with a sermon titled, God's Delight in Blessing Us. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.